everyone welcome back to my channel today i'm gonna be taking you around my snowy backyard in zone 9a here we actually got some snow and tell you a little bit about habitat fragmentation and how some of the concepts around habitat fragmentation when it relates to wildlife movement and how some of the barriers to wildlife movement might actually be impacting the animals that are moving through your property and how you can go ahead and fix those barriers to movement. So I'm going to take you around my yard and show you some of the things I'm doing to help improve wildlife movement in my property from a very micro micro scale and um, tell you about how you can implement some of the same ideas. So before we start, I want to explain what habitat fragmentation is and what wildlife movement and connectivity is. So from a very large general sense, um, habitat fragmentation is when wildlife habitat is, I mean, you can probably tell by the name, it's fragmented. And so the problem there is that animals may have trouble moving between these little patches of habitat due to development and the way that we've structured our cities where there might be two amazing parks that provide habitat for an animal, but if the animal has no safe way to go in between them, they're just gonna be separate and fragmented and it's gonna really impact the habitat that's available to that species. So a lot of researchers are working on a large macro scale in how to connect all of these habitats and how to allow animals to move between them. Can we take some of those principles that researchers are using from a large scale and apply them to a small scale in just how animals are moving through our own yards? And that can help increase the wildlife that you are seeing in your yard and increase the health of wildlife in your community. So first, you need to learn. <laughs> Before you even change anything, you have to learn what's on your landscape. So I'm sitting here in my side yard because this is one of my little observation areas. It's a tucked away little spot where I can watch animals and sit here and observe and be quiet and see how animals are already moving through my landscape. So I want to pay attention to species observed. That's one of the really important things. And you don't even need to be like, that's a chickadee, that's a nuthatch. I mean, that obviously helps. You can even just go with the general animal categories, bird, small mammal, amphibians, ungulates, large mammals, raptors, and kind of see if you have any of those animals present and record if you would like uh, in a journal and just keep an eye on what you already have because that's gonna help you with your planning down the line. You also will want to make sure it's relevant through the seasons and observe through all of the seasons. You can do a whole year of observation because species presence and the way the animals use your landscape is going to vary based on the time of the year. So the next thing you want to do, and I'm down here low to the ground, because you want to think like an animal. So you have to think about those species that you identified or the species categories that you identified and how they would move and think in your landscape. So this one's kind of fun um, if you are creative. So th this might involve you learning a little bit more about the species of the animals if you don't already know very much about them. But think like a frog, for example, if you're trying to improve connectivity for a frog. How is a frog gonna move around? Like if you were as small as a little frog bouncing around here, what challenges are you gonna face? Um, you know, looking at this big, wide, open, flat lawn, maybe that's something you wouldn't really wanna jump across as a frog, especially if um, there was a large homeowner with a lawn mower right next to you. That just set up a plot for frog or the video game. And I literally mean go through each of the animals or the species categories that you developed and just like go through the exercise of thinking how that animal would move around, what kind of things would it be attracted to, what kind of things would it not be attracted to or want to get away from, what sort of predators might uh, impact that animal when they're moving through your land. We're over here in my side yard and my ocean spray is trying to grab me and pull me in, but the first barrier to movement that's common in city landscapes is fences. And fences represent a lot for us as humans, I think um, there's a lot of kind of things that a fence might mean. It kind of means stay off, right? This is mine, this is my property and you're not allowed to come in. <laughs> That's my, that might be what it means for uh, humans, but that can also be what it means for animals, especially if your fence is excluding certain animals. So the reason why I'm over here is because you can see there's a little gap in the fence down here. This is where animals are coming in through my fence, through my property. So I'm having a lot of small mammals come here. I can see raccoon tracks all around me. Uh, there's some bird tracks around. That's how animals are getting into my landscape from this side. So 
I don't mind having these small mammals in here. I want them to come in here. So I maintain this small little gap under here to allow them to move in. But think about the fencing you have on your property and if it might be impacting the movement of certain species that you want to attract. Having gaps in the fencing might help you bring in more small mammals, reptiles, amphibians, some of the other low-lying animals that might not be flying over your fence. Fences can also be used from the perspective of excluding species. If you do exclude deer from your property, fencing is one of the main things. Uh, if you also exclude invasive species or non-native introduced species, that are larger such as in some areas wild boar have been quite devastating when introduced um, fencing is actually a tool that you can use to exclude the species you don't want and allow entry for the species that you do want for some species a barrier to movement might be cover so I'm sitting next to my brush pile it's just for my trimmings this year but for some smaller species, such as reptiles and amphibians, they're less likely to move through landscape if there's not sufficient cover for them to cross a large open area. This might also apply for some other small species vulnerable to predation from birds. So one of the things you can do is you can introduce brush piles, rock piles, log piles, that's another one, or other forms of cover for these small species, especially if you're trying to create a movement corridor for them. You'll want to have some of the rock piles kind of adequately spaced so they'll be able to move from cover to cover. This is actually a trick that I learned at work because one of the things that they do in order to allow reptiles to move through under highway culverts, they'll actually make rock piles at a certain distance apart in order to allow the reptiles to move from rock pile to rock pile comfortably which will allow them to properly use that landscape so that's something you can probably pretty easily implement in your own yard one big issue that you can have is visual disturbance so visual disturbance can cause some species to not want to enter an area so visual disturbance um, that can come from a lot of different things it could come from people really heavily using a landscape some species just won't want to be that close to people one tip for reducing visual disturbance to animals is this is kind of a garden plan I found in one of my books you can see the human spaces are down here and the wild spaces are back here and there's a little bit of a buffer between them so that there's a little bit less human disturbance back here so this could be an area for birds to nest or more sensitive activities to occur that's not saying that you need to leave some sort of lawn in between that that's not the case at all because there are some species who are not that impacted by human disturbance but just having these little quiet nooks in your backyard uh, will help with visual disturbance. Another thing too is to keep away from nesting birds if they are observed in these areas back here. One thing that's a little bit out of the box is light disturbance. Outdoor lights and light pollution can be a big issue for insects and it can be a big issue for migratory birds. So there's a lot of research about this. I'll link it in the description, but things like keeping your porch light off at night unless you're using it or putting your floodlights on a timer and not having a bunch of lights throughout your yard will overall reduce the amount of light pollution and help wildlife in your yard. You might have already thought of this and it's kind of simple but another issue might be lack of appropriate habitat for that species so that's where that exercise of identifying what species are using your habitat and what habitat those species pr prefer is really important here because you might think oh i have great habitat i have a pollinator meadow i have this this that but certain species you might want to attract only use a specific plant for example i'm thinking butterflies and milkweed for example and if you don't have the milkweed you're probably not going to get them in and laying eggs on your other uh, plant species so you want to think about native plants so a lot of times having a wide diversity of native plants is going to help solve this issue to a certain extent patch size is the minimum amount of habitat an animal basically needs to be self-sufficient in that area so it might be a case of there's just not enough native plants that that animal needs in your area or not enough appropriate shrub cover or dense thickets this one's a little bit hard to address on a micro level but for attracting species that are more suited for urban landscapes um, just planting native plants is a first start but the more you can convince your neighbors to also plant native plants and increasing that available habitat for the species you want to attract is going to make a big 
difference in the local species population and what you're seeing in your own property. And it's a lot of fun to learn about all the species that were in your area before it was um, turned into a residential area and non-native species were planted. So bringing in the native plants is going to increase your insect diversity, it's going to increase um, the food availability for a lot of your species and something that's more of an appropriate diet than a non-native plant. So before you start implementing some of these recommendations, I do have a few warnings. So some of the warnings is one, um, d when you're thinking about wildlife movement and attracting species to your yard, um, think about the dangers too. So you don't want to attract and bring in species to dangerous areas for them. So danger might mean a busy road. Bringing all your species and moving them right towards a freeway might not be the greatest idea for them. So don't put all of your shrubs with food for birds right next to um, a area where an outdoor cat is. The most important thing at the end of all this though is to watch, to observe, to listen, to explore. <laughs> to experiments you know we can't do it all perfectly and some of the changes we might implement might have an impact that we didn't anticipate and we learn and we get better over time so don't get lost in over analysis but observation and learning from the best teacher the earth is uh, one of the best things you can do in your land planting native plants can truly be an exercise in reconnecting with the land that sustains us and the land that we want to improve and return back to what it once was for wildlife and for insects so thank you guys so much for watching and i will see you guys next time bye